What makes dense, highly concentrated and organized human settlement a desirable way of life globally? In a world that increasingly appears ungovernable, cities, not states, are the islands of governance on which the future world order will be built. The transformative force of urbanization has helped millions escape poverty through increased productivity, employment opportunities, improved quality of life and large-scale investment in infrastructure and services. Key elements that influence the evolution of cities include time, history and historical context, place, space and geography, actors involved, as well as values, ideas and ideology. The cradle of humankind, situated near to the Gauteng city region, shares with Ethiopia the longest and oldest record of human settlement in the world. More recently, this area was home to the largest kingdom on the subcontinent, which traded ivory, iron, copper and gold with Egypt, Persia, India and China. Evidence of this Iron Age society, which coexisted with San communities, who had inhabited the region since the Stone Age, has been found across Greater Joburg. The infrastructure of South Africa's colonial ports was geared to the extractive economy. Later, apartheid spatial design displaced the indigenous black population, producing cities that are incredibly inefficient and deliberately underserviced. Townships were built as labor camps on the periphery, in economically undesirable spaces. In 2000, South Africa's constitutional democracy allocated legislative and executive authority to the three spheres of government, transformed local governments committed to working with citizens and groups within the community to find sustainable ways to meet their social, economic and material needs. Remember there was that RDP period, government really focused on making sure that people that didn't have houses, they had houses, that program is still running. But then at a local level you had a period between early 2000s to around 2010-2011, cities focused on township growth, that's when we saw a lot of the things happening in Soweto and areas like those. Things are still taking place. I mean, the backdrop here, you've got houses of uh, landlords, so there's history in there. You've got Harare away from Harare, some of them is Kinshasa away from Kinshasa, especially in the 90s and, and so on, and you find that other places like in Yeovil and others, so you had some hippies, and some of the artists we were talking about lived in this area. So there's so many layers in the city. I would like to see young people empower one another, think, be critical, and not always rely on handouts. In like five to ten years' time, if Kenton Park is what it is right now, then I think Kenton Park is Lagos. Because it's going to be busy, it's going to be jamming. Everybody just being happy, man, you know? You not know, wake up in the morning and all cleaned up because now you're going to work a heavy job, you know what I'm saying? The condition we live in townships is not good. We've got a lot of land, man. You know, townships must be at least proper houses, not those RTP houses. I've got very big dreams for Cape Town because I think it's got beautiful people, it's a beautiful city. We take the indigenous people who inhabited Cape Town for thousands of years prior to colonialization. They had customs that were very rich in terms of the collective value. They had a relationship with each other and a relationship to nature. We spoke about the cultural, religious symbols attached to water. So imagine when you don't have water, what happens to the time for salah or for prayers? There's this attachment to, to the natural environment. So loss thereof means there's loss of identity, there's loss of well-being. But we don't talk about it, you know, even in conferences, th that discussion doesn't happen around those things because it's seen as fluff. There's a rich tradition there that we need to reconnect with. Because if one subscribes to that value system, it will lead to, I think, a much better quality of life and much better cities. African cities are at the forefront of accelerated change. Demographically, economically, environmentally, and in general development. 
a new vision is expressed in the Integrated Urban Development Framework, a global trend in pursuit of sustainable, inclusive and productive models. It has four goals which encompass inclusive urban economic growth, urban land and spatial integration, urban well-being and inclusion, and urban governance. Point of order, Very crudely, when we talk about livability, it's about is the area functioning? Am I as a person that is in that particular space? Am I not feeling like I'm a forgotten user? Cape Town does need to be more inclusive to make people feel that they don't have to break their backs in order to belong. The time has come and gone for us to just want to do it in the township and to remain separate. This is the time for integration. Let's own whatever piece of the city we can so that there is longevity for black people in the city itself. The defining attribute of making a sustainable city is systems thinking. So you'd include the social elements in there, the ecological or environmental issues in there, and the economic issues would be part and parcel of that. In balance, all of those three are equally important. So when the market started in 1996, Long Street itself was uh, quite dead in terms of business and business activity. The impact was that it did develop a, a strong sense of tourism in the space. So Long Street became a, a tourist zone. It created an opportunity for black small business entrepreneurs and creatives and artists to feel that they belonged to a hub. The relationship between business and the rest of society hasn't been great over the last number of years in South Africa. They summarily asked us to leave uh, some two and a half years ago and the reason was that they wanted to renovate. We were open to upping the rentals. However, there was a very strong sense that our kind of business no longer had a place in that particular building. It's not wrong in and of itself to get the investment from outside in. Where it becomes a problem is when you're doing it at the cost of the citizens that live there. I think it's a worldwide trend. In New York, people spend close to half their salary if they want to live in the city. At the policy level, government is quite clear on what needs to happen. The big problem, however, is at the implementation level. Yes. First of all, yes. the municipality of yeah. East London doesn't care. Where I'm born, I, I don't see, I don't see any development. Taba, taba, taba. Yeah, they are trying, but it's not enough. The metro is the one who's the core face. So all these complaints usually come to us, and we have to try and deal with them. It's not a very easy exercise. Our citizens require us to deliver, but we don't have the fiscal. We do have our own useful fiscal that we use. The only problem is the integration levels. It's not really there. When we do raise all this information to the relevant spheres for assistance, for integration, to try and bring solidarity and delivery for the citizens, it doesn't come across as that. The city need to think about climate change, food security, land reform, and how it can develop those policies. We stand to lose all of this because the city and the province is supporting developers and mining companies to turn this area into a big dump. Maybe it's about our own understanding of what it means to create spaces in an African context. Much you borrow from Western concepts which are now proven to not, to not work. You know, the website of the city says it's inclusive, it's caring, it's well run. But in practice, it's not like that. It is the conscious agency and choices underpinned by the values, understanding, power relations and culture of the actors involved at any one time that has shaped cities. This too will determine the future success of cities. Someone will get robbed around here and people will just watch instead of helping. We need to get back to how we used to live back in the day. I'm working here at the Amy Bill Centre. We work with underprivileged children. There's about four teachers that help. Those that can't pay, they don't pay. But those that can afford to pay, they do pay. And with that money, we try and make it happen here for ourselves. Because democracy means that you have to become active citizens where we participate in the working of government and holding government to account in between the election. So I mean the fact that people are taken to the streets, they toy toying, is a very positive development. 
people asserting that they have certain rights, these voices need to be heard. Artists actually create profound stories. They have a way of defining the human condition. And I think for any designer, be it an urban designer, be it an architect, when you borrow from that and you couple that with techniques and tools from your discipline, you've got a broader perspective. I think one of the key aspects of any developmental project is the engagement that the city has with all of the stakeholders. And all of the stakeholders certainly include citizens. Transnet owns the waterfront, but of course us as government, us as the metro, we through our authority over planning and land use management have a significant role to play on how such a development would then pan out. I think in South Africa we often tend to live in kind of parallel universes. Government doesn't understand the private sector and the private sector doesn't understand government and so you do need a kind of bridging process. On the other hand, there are organs of civil society, issue-bound groups. One cannot merely depend on your parliamentary system to deliver on your needs. There's this stewardship that happens and activism that happens. But I think when everyone knows where and agrees to the vision, so that different ways to get there are secondary. And then there needs to be an agreement of where that is. So unless all those things are in place, achieving the city which is safe, inclusive, resilient and sustainable is going to remain a pipe dream. What will our cities look like in 2050? How do we undo the legacy structures of the past while reinventing for the future? What will the consequences be if we fail to think and act together? How do we activate an all-of-society approach to the urban agenda?